By the end of October, the darkness has returned. Long before the commercialization of Halloween, the old festival of All Hallows, or Samhain, celebrated the end of the old year and the thin veil between the worlds of the earth and the supernatural. This is a time of death, decay and breakdown. The plant world has prepared for the new beginnings of next year, and only those evergreen plants like holly, ivy and yew remain green. Good evening, and welcome back to the Forest Garden. Today is October the 31st, the time when the veil is thinnest between worlds, and unusual and mysterious happenings are much more likely to occur. It's been a year to the day since I recorded that introduction sequence you just saw. And now I'm a year older. A year wiser? Possibly. But it's been 11 years to this very day since I spent my first night here on the land before I'd even begun to co-create the forest garden. Over the past 11 years of all the days and nights I've spent here, many, many things have happened. Some mundane, yet interesting, but some bordering on the otherworldly and seemingly unexplainable. But what to tell you about this evening? I could tell you about the barn owls that usually follow me home after I've had a late night out and are often seen waiting for me on my gate to make sure I get back safely, like escort owls. I could tell you about the numerous toads I found waiting in my bed when I peel back the covers, ready to get into it. Toads often seem to appear, for me at least, at pivotal times of change in my life, at places where I would not expect to find them such as in my bed, on the toilet seat, and more far-fetched places besides. I could tell you about the rats and all their clever ways and how they have learned to get into the treadle feeders, the special feeding devices that the ducks and the chickens have learned to step on the pedals open the special trap door to access their food and the rats they're not heavy enough to step on these pedals so they gather together in numbers of six sevens eights or nines open the pedal and take it in turns to feed in a very cooperative way i could tell you again about the story of the leeches in the water pipes getting stuck in the water pumps coming out the tap horse leeches huge ones and all the shenanigans, fun and frolics that are involved in getting them out the pipes. But there's another video about that. 
I could tell you about the adder in the greenhouse, England's only poisonous snake that I nearly stepped on with my bare feet when it was basking on the rocks in the sun. I could tell you about the poor badger that I hit with my bicycle. Don't worry, it was absolutely fine, but I flew over the handlebars and ended up with the badger lying on my chest. Big things they are, before it scrabbled at my neck and ran away into the hedge. I could tell you about the numerous swarms of honeybees that have turned up unexpectedly 10,000 strong and the different places they've moved into around the garden at seemingly unusual times, including a pair of Wellington boots in my shed. I could tell you about the weasel I saw last month dragging away a dead rat that it had killed. The rat was three times the size of the weasel. Or maybe I could tell you about the stoat that I saw yesterday slinking through the grass, eyeing up the chickens, waiting for a chance to, to strike, supposedly. Or maybe it just wanted the eggs. I don't know. But I shan't tell you any more about those tonight. I have chosen ten animal tales from the forest garden, things that have happened in the last ten or eleven years. <laughs> these stories are short and none of them are scary. A little bit mysterious, some of them funny, maybe. The first story is called Green Frog. Some of you who have watched my previous videos may have heard of Green Frog. Green Frog was a green common garden frog. One summer's day, I was strimming some very long grass, making a lot of noise as the head of the strimmer was whizzing round and round. As I was strimming through a particularly dense patch of very damp grass, the pitch of the strimmer changed and made a <coughs> sound, and I knew it was already too late. And I ripped off my goggles, took off the harness, and put the strimmer down and to my horror, I found that I had strimmed a frog, or what was left of a frog. One of its eyes had been sliced across, its front leg was hanging off, and there were bloody lacerations all over its back. I really thought it was dead instantly, which would have been the best thing at the time. I started crying, I picked up the frog and held it in my hands wishing for a miracle. It looked dead, it was limp. However, I somehow knew that it wasn't dead and it just had that look of life about it. So I cupped the poor thing in my hands and walked down to the greenhouse where there are various pools and buckets of water. And I put my hands under the water to clear away the blood so I could see the damage and it was very bad. But I put a large rock in the water just laid the frog just under the surface of the water so it could put its head out if it wanted to on the rock and I couldn't do any more so I left it there but I did check on it every half an hour for the rest of the day and it did start to breathe again and two of its remaining limbs began to twitch I couldn't do any more for it so I checked on it the next morning and the wounds had begun to heal the leg that was hanging off had started to reattach. The eye that had sliced through was clear and bright again but it still had some cuts on its back and I checked on it again as often as I could throughout that day and by the end of the second day Green Frog had completely healed, visibly anyway, but it was still on the rock not really moving. Anyway, I give it a lot of attention. I stroked it. I don't really know how to look after a frog apart from keeping it moist. And the greenhouse is the very best place to find slugs, which frogs love to eat. And I picked up a few of the smallest manageable sized slugs I could find and put them near the edge of the tub that the green frog was in. I don't know if it ate them or not, but on day three, the frog had disappeared. 
so had the slugs, and didn't think any more of it. Until about three days later when I was in the greenhouse, watering it, that a green frog, I assume the same one, hopped up from the undergrowth, I think they were alpine strawberries at the time, and perched itself on the edge of the tub where it had been recovering. I said, hello green frog. It didn't say anything, it just, <laughs> obviously. And it looked up at me and I went down to touch it and said, may I touch you? And, and I stroked the frog, it didn't hop away. And then we just had a moment where we looked at each other and it disappeared back into the, the strawberry foliage undergrowth. The amazing thing is that this happened every day when I was watering the greenhouse. A green frog would appear, have a little stroke, and then disappear back into the undergrowth. This went on for the rest of the summer, and I didn't see it again over the winter. However, the next springtime, when I'd all but forgotten about green frog, it appeared again, as if to welcome the spring and said, hello. This was four years ago, and my last visitation from green frog was a year ago this summer time. Since then the greenhouse has had a new cover and had a revamp. It's now a geodome, which you will see in an upcoming video. But I like to think that green frog is still around and has made a full recovery. I don't know if amphibians can make a full recovery, but this frog did and is now living a happy life, or so I like to believe, in the garden and is hopefully keeping away from the ducks. This next story sounds a little more far-fetched, but is no less true, and I call it The Elder Tree Fairies. Just behind the yurt here, not 12 feet beyond the edge, one of my prize treasured trees in the forest garden is an American elder. It's a Sambucus nigra canadensis and it has really big elderberries, very good for making the highly prized and medicinal elderberry syrup. The tree here is now seven years old. It fruited very well this year, but about two years ago, I was saying on a garden tour to someone that I really wanted a second tree because they fruit a lot better if they have a pollinating partner another tree so that the bees can cross-pollinate the flowers to create more elderberries. I could have taken a cutting and propagated another tree that would be a genetic clone, but it is better to get a tree from different stock for the genetic diversity. I tried to get one for years, but they were always out of stock when I ordered them. And I said to this tour group, in fact I said it out loud, I said, I remember the words. I said, I wish I had another American elder tree and I thought no more of it until the next day. Most of you may know that I sleep in a shepherd's hut about 30 feet behind the yurt just here. That's my bedroom. This is my kitchen, this yurt and my storytelling place. The next morning, after the tour, I was walking down the steps of my shepherd's hut to go and let the ducks out when my left elbow brushed against some foliage that was not there the night before. In my bleary, sleepy-eyed state, I rubbed my eyes, just like a cartoon, and lo and behold, to the left of the steps of the shepherd's hut, one branch of which was growing through the steps and coming out around my slippers was another American elder tree, at least a year old, roots deep in the ground. It looked like it had been there forever, yet the day before it had not been. Would you like to see a picture of it? I took a picture for you about three months ago. There it is. My second American elder, wished for and provided. Thank you, elder fairies. 
this next story I call The Slug and the Tomato. Ten years and eleven months ago, during a cold November night, it was my first month here in the forest garden. At the time I had a white caravan and had this yurt set up somewhere else in the garden in its previous original incarnation. They were next to each other, adjoined by an awning. That's not so important, apart from the fact that the caravan that I was using as my kitchen, it was terrorised by an enormous slug. I never saw the slug, but every morning when I was making my breakfast, there were slimy fat trails over everything. They were making figure of eights on the windows. They were running over all my cups that were hanging up. There were nibble marks on the, on the cardboard corners of the cereal packets. And no matter how hard I looked, I could never find this slug. This went on for a couple of weeks. Anyway, forget about the slug for now. One evening, I had my lap tray in front of the fire here in the yurt, when the yurt was over there. I don't remember what I had. It was a whole smorgasbord of delicious salady stuff. And I had some cherry tomatoes. I had a mug of some sort of herbal tea as well. Balancing the tray on my lap, one of the cherry tomatoes rolled off my plate and <coughs> plopped into my mug of tea. Being the thrifty, non-wasteful chap that I am, when I'd finished my tea, I picked the tomato out and ate it. Just because I didn't want to waste it, doesn't matter if it's been in the tea. The tomato was extremely bitter when I took my first bite into it and it did not taste right at all. I spat the tomato out onto my empty plate and it was not a tomato. It was the biggest, fattest, black and orange slug you ever did see in your life. There was no tomato in my cup. The tomato was found on the floor later. It had missed my cup. I'd imagined the plop. And when I'd made my tea, when I'd poured the boiling water in, that's where the slug must have been hiding in the day. I had boiled the slug alive, hopefully an instant death. And just to add insult to injury, I had then bitten into the slug that was about the size of a cherry tomato when all, all, oh, when all balled up at the bottom of the cup. So that is the story of the slug and the tomato. Oh! This story is called The Blackbird. The following March, 10 and a half years ago, I was sleeping in the yurt. I had a double bed in there. And next to the bed was a bookshelf. It was not a full bookshelf at the time. There were several gaps in it. And as I opened my eyes early that March morning, I came face to face with a female blackbird. In the time it had taken since sunrise and when I woke up about two hours later, she had fashioned a beautiful nest. I don't remember what it was made from. I have a photograph of it somewhere. I'll see if I can include it had moss and sticks and feathers. It was nearly constructed beautifully and perfectly between Bill Bryson's The Short History of Nearly Everything and How to Learn Italian Fast. And when I woke up, she just looked at me. She said, what are you doing here? I said, what am I doing here? I live here. What are you doing here? She said, I live here now. I said, but you can't build a nest on my bookshelf. I said, the door is going to be closed at some point. You I'm going to be busy in here. You're not going to like it. And she said, I could build a nest here if I want to. I said, no, you can't. You need to move it somewhere else. I said, you've put all that effort in. And anyway, she looked at me. She was furious. She couldn't believe that I'd woken up and dared to tell her she couldn't build a nest there. Anyway, in a what seemed like a, a teenage tantrum, she broke her nest to bits with her beak. She just shattered it. All the bits of the nest went everywhere. And she went and flew out of the yurt door, which was ajar, and that's how she got in. I was a bit disappointed, because she had put all that effort into the nest, but the next day, I was about to get all my beehives up together for the, for the coming swarmy season, and I went to put my 
bee suit on and that same female blackbird had reconstructed her nest in the pocket of my beekeeping suit and that is the year because I didn't want to disturb her I didn't want to move my beekeeping suit that's the year I discovered natural beekeeping with a more hands-off approach because I couldn't use my beekeeping suit that year and the wonderful thing is she brought up a wonderful clutch a brood of I was gonna say blackberry chicks what are they called I'm getting tired now not black currant chicks blackbird <laughs> blackbird chicks and those blackbirds stayed around and actually we got on really well in the end this female blackbird and I I seldom saw the male and the following year she built a nest behind my solar panel control unit and brought up another beautiful four chicks and those blackbirds are still around today in fact they are the little pesky birds that stole all my grapes this year and almost every other type of soft fruit I've had here but I'm pleased that they are still living here they think of it as their home too in fact they were probably here long before I was this next story I call chocolate boots it happened the following February February the 14th to be exact St Valentine's Day I had bought a couple of gifts for someone rather special at the time one of those being a box of the finest chocolates coated in that cellophane that new boxes of chocolates unopened often come wrapped in I'd left it on the table in the yurt a safe enough place I went to collect her to bring her back to the forest garden. I was only gone about 90 minutes, an hour and a half. And upon coming back to the yurt, she was delighted that I'd been thoughtful enough to get her some chocolates. And I presented her with the box. I thought it felt a bit light. I thought I might have been misremembering. She opened it, took off the cellophane, opened the box. There wasn't a single chocolate inside. She thought I was playing a trick on her. And I said, no, it, it was full. I mean, I'm sure it was full. It was heavier just now. We could not work out what had happened. It wasn't until I inspected the box closely that I noticed that one of the corners of the cardboard had a teeny tiny little hole in it. I couldn't have been sure if it was there before or not, but I assumed not. I suspect I know what happened. The following morning, I think I was about to walk the dog. I went to put on my Wellington boots and one of the boots was filled to the brim with chocolates. The mice, yes, if you hadn't guessed it, mice or a mouse, a mouse, had nibbled its way into the box and removed so diligently every single chocolate and stowed them in what it thought would be a safe place in one of my Wellington boots. I'd like to say the chocolates were then enjoyed, but they weren't. They had to be got rid of. But upon inspecting the chocolates closely, they did have little teeth marks in each corner where they must have been dragged across the table, down the table leg, across the floor, and stowed safely in the boot. This is a bit of a two-part story because I don't remember which year it was. Perhaps it was the same year, but in the autumn time, one of the many squirrels around here harvested very helpfully every single one of my hazelnuts and cobnuts. Cobnuts are like big hazelnuts and squirrels as they do for the winter they bury the nuts I don't know where and what I suspect was the same mouse or family of mice found where this squirrel had buried all the hazelnuts and removed them and stowed them safely for the mousy winter. Yes, you've guessed it. Not one, but both my Wellington boots were filled with hazelnuts one morning. And unlike the chocolates, these were able to be eaten because they hadn't been touched by mice because they had the shells on. So I thought seeing as the mice had put so much thievery work into collecting these nuts secretively and surreptitiously from the squirrels that I would leave one boot for the mice and have one boot for myself 
So that is a way <laughs> to get your nuts harvested for you. Let the squirrels and the mice do the work and then leave half for them. That hasn't happened since. I wonder if I could train them to do it. Hmm. Maybe it's because I haven't been leaving my boots in the right place. Seven years ago, when I moved out from the yurt and the adjoining kitchen caravan next to it, although pretty resilient, it wasn't really built for the British winters and the camel hair canvas had rotted. Also, I wasn't looking after it particularly well and it was against a hedge where it got damp on one side where the wind couldn't circulate and dry it. And the caravan, already an old one, the floor was falling out. So the caravan, was repurposed by a man who kept chickens to turn it into a chicken house and the yurt was packed up ready for its current incarnation about five years later. That's not part of the story but it does lead on to the fact that I got a much larger a 24 foot long caravan and I situated it right down at the bottom of the garden where nobody goes and I painted it green. And it was my very first night in that caravan that I was asleep and living the way that I do so close to the woods and on the land like this, it's shared with all these creatures, many more besides that I've mentioned in the stories. The first night I was in the yurt, there were all sorts of grunts and snuffles from the outside and I lay there terrified in my bed the next morning I realised it was just badgers, but when your imagination starts doing wild things in the night, you imagine all sorts of beasts snuffling a couple of inches away the other side of the canvas. But this first night in that freshly painted green caravan down at the bottom of the garden, close to the woods, I was awoken by a bang in the night, so violent and loud that the caravan rocked. and. I lay there, paralysed with fear, for a, well, it seemed like minutes, but it was only a few seconds, until I strapped on my head torch and went outside to see a full-sized, probably a 10-foot high stag, proper 12-point antlers, limping away across the adjacent field, back up to the woods. I'm sure he was okay, but he had a bit of a shock he was used to leaping over the hedge into the garden to graze at night and I don't think he saw my 24 foot freshly painted green caravan there so um, he was probably more shocked than I was The Foxy Escort Seven years ago when I was living in that green caravan at the bottom of the garden I often used to visit my mum who lives a couple of fields down at the edge of the village. I still do visit her, but at that time, when I was walking back up from her place to mine at night, I often used to see, just out of range of my torch beam, a pair of close together luminous eyes. And those eyes used to walk with me just out of range of the torch beam and every time I stopped the eyes stopped sometimes they'd look around and blink but they'd always walk with me just a few feet away until I got back home then they'd disappear this went on for weeks and it was after a few weeks that I realized the eyes belonged to a big old dog fox he was really big quite sort of like haggard looking, like he'd been in lots of fights and had lots of life experience. He was a friendly enough fellow, and he not always, but often used to appear. As I walked out my mum's back door, switched on my torch, there he'd be, waiting for me. And over the months, he got closer and closer. He never walked right next to me, but he showed himself. He walked within range of the torch so I could see him clearly. And I knew that he was escorting me back up. I don't know if it was because I needed his protection, his safety, or if he was just interested in me, 
or if he was just after amusement, but we often had a chat and we walked back up together at night and the moment I got to my door, it's funny, foxes never say goodbye. As soon as I got to the door, he'd just be off. But no matter how slowly I wended my way back up home, or even if I took a slightly different route, he'd be there, just not too close, just within range of the torch beam, walking along beside me through mist and snow and rain, but only ever in the dark. I used to wonder what happened to that big old dog fox because this unique foxy escorting period of life only lasted about a year. And then about five years ago, I came across his body. Someone had shot him in the field next to the woods up there. I don't know why they'd shot him. Maybe it was the gamekeeper looking after the pheasants. Maybe he was terrorizing somebody's sheep, although I very much doubt it. Anyway, I stood over his shotgun pellet riddled body and I had one last look into his eyes and thanked him for all those nighttime escorts. Many of you will be familiar with keeping chickens and how they always, or almost always, lay their eggs in one place in their nesty brood box or somewhere safe away from predators. Ducks sometimes do this, but more often than not, the ducks will just lay their eggs whilst they're marching around looking for slugs, the eggs will just plop out of them, or they'll just squat down briefly, lay an egg and then carry on. Sometimes they do become broody and they make little little hollows in the damp grass or nesty places, but the majority of the time the 14 khaki Campbell ducks that I have patrolling this two and a half acre site, the eggs will just plop out of them and I'll never find them. And well, the purpose of keeping the ducks here, I mean, I love ducks and they are my pets, but they're also fantastic at keeping on top of the slug population. It's said that nobody has a slug problem. They have a duck deficiency, but that's besides the point. The point is it wasn't until I developed a symbiotic relationship with the resident crows that I started to collect a lot more duck eggs. You see there's a large ash tree to the west of the garden here that overlooks it and the crows have learned that duck eggs are a tasty treat. They have learned the body language or whatever it is, or whatever other way they can tell of how or when a duck is about to lay an egg. They start gathering in the ash tree talking to each other for the old squawk. And there is about a 20 second window of time between when I notice the crows in the tree and the duck lays the egg. Then the race begins. There's maybe five or 10 seconds when the crow swoops to pick up the freshly laid duck egg. And if I notice that the crows are about to swoop, I'm charging across the garden and whoever gets to the duck egg first wins and gets to keep it. So it's useful for me, otherwise I'd never know where the eggs were. And it's useful for the crows because half the time they get a tasty egg, but it is worth their while because if it wasn't for me keeping the ducks, then they wouldn't ever have any eggs at all. And it's a daily competition as to who will get the duck egg first. This last story probably creates the most food for thought. Typically at the bottom of the garden where there is now a little fairy garden to welcome the other folk or the little people. That was the place where this happened, where there was a gap in the willow trees. Beyond the willow trees is a stream with a large hawthorn trees and beyond that a meadow, and beyond that the wood. This was in the second year I was here, nine or ten years ago. Those of you who watched that video of mine, was it a March update? It was earlier this year, where I showed you the fairy garden, and I said about all the mysterious things that go on at that point in the garden, comings and goings at dawn and dusk. 
this story seems tame in comparison to the things that have happened since this story. But this was my initiation into the things that slip in and out of dimensions and come and go from the garden. Good things, I believe. It was dusk, typically. It had been a hot summer's day and it was the first relent from the heat, the first cool of the night air, and the sky was just tinting that deep blue colour after the sun was setting in the west. And I was just observing things when, how do I say it? From that gap in the willow trees floats a luminous glowing purple orb. I looked astounded for a few moments and said, what are you then? The orb, unlike a bubble blown from a, what are those things called you blow bubbles? <laughs> bubble blower? It seemed to have a mind of its own and it seemed shy and it went back behind the trunk of the willow tree. I said, it's all right, come out. And it came out from behind the willow tree. It floated towards me ever so slowly. And we had this moment where we were looking at each other. Well, I felt like I was being watched anyway. And then it came closer to me. It came so close. It was, <laughs> sounds trippy-ish, but it wasn't one size or another. Sometimes it was larger, sometimes smaller, but I couldn't see it changing size. You're going to tell me now it's called perspective, isn't it? As it gets closer, it gets bigger, but it did come closer and it came right up in front of my face. So much so that it, it went through my head so that my vision became purple for a moment before whipping at incredible speed whoosh, back about 20, 30 feet away to the gap in the hedge between the willows. And I wasn't sure what else to say. I said, oh, um, I can't remember what I said now. I'd like to say, it would make good storytelling if I say I'd said something really clever, but I don't think I'd said anything clever. I think I said, just said something like, oh, thanks for that, or good night or something, and whoosh, whipped away. It's not the first time that's happened. I mean, that was the first time it's happened. I meant, that's not the last time it's happened, but the stories are quite similar. Well, I do hope you enjoyed those 10 tales of creatures in the forest garden. Do you hear the owls? They're very active tonight. Once again, thank you very much for watching and see you soon. Bye bye.